So we are at the end of the season and our final game in charge of Crystal Palace will soon be upon us. But can we get Champions League football for Palace? So following on from the last episode, the defeat in the quarterfinals against Spurs in the FA Cup, we followed that up with a 2-0 away win against West Ham back in league action. Martin Alfonso and Marvin Munganga getting the goals in this one. We then suffered a weird defeat against Norwich City in league action. Matty O'Rea getting two goals in the second half to kill our hopes and dreams. We bounced back though with a home win against Newcastle United. Martin Alfonso, Jim Garcia and Alexander with the goals. We then went away from former club Huddersfield and won 2 nil. Fabio Andre and Marvin Munganga, let's just call him Marvin, uh, <laughs> got the two goals to give us the win. We then faced former club Nottingham Forest at home and won 2 1. Yuri Karaviev with two goals inside 16 minutes, giving us the win. And finally, it was a 3 0 comfortable win against Brentford at home. Andy Patton, Yuri Karaviev, and Alexander with the goals. And that sees the Premier League table looking like this. We have beat Barnsley, we have beat Nottingham Forest. We can go level on points. Just had to check the leaderboard there. We can go level on points with Huddersfield if we do win today's game. But of course, in terms of Palace and their future, Champions League football would be absolutely amazing. We need Spurs to get beat, basically, in the final day of the season. Uh, even if they draw, there is a pretty big discrepancy in terms of the uh, goal difference, which means we probably wouldn't be able to get it. They have Burnley at home. Ugh, that's, that's disappointing. Burnley at home probably means Champions League football might not be coming to Palace, but here, maybe it will. So our final game of the season comes away from home against bottom of the league, Crystal Palace. So uh, fingers crossed we can get three points. That'll be our job done. Uh, we just need Burnley then to do us a massive, massive favour and somehow beat Spurs in their final game of the season. But this is how we're going to line up. Klaus Jensen in goal, Marvin, Garcia, Nuno and Andre in the defence, Pierre and Gill in the midfield, Caravia, Pat on, Roger playing in behind. Martin Alfonso, let's get into the game and let's get a nice, comfortable three points, please. So Aston Villa come at us with a 5-2-1-2 formation. Uh, De Silva is an absolutely fantastic player, 30 years old now, uh, but he's still he's someone who's been on my radar for a very, very long time. Uh, Pericord playing left back, I'm pretty sure he was playing for Leeds United not so long ago, as was Luke Holland. So uh, some former names there, at least from what I remember, not players we signed, but players that came and joined them afterwards. Let's get into the game and see how we get on. So we will keep an eye on the latest scores. Uh, Spurs are at home against Burnley. It's still 0-0, 15 minutes in their game as well. Hopefully Burnley can uh, pull off a little bit of a miracle. In terms of our game though, the first 25 minutes or so have not been too bad going by the match stats. Just no highlights as of yet. Here we have our first one. Andy Pat on to Marvin. He whips it in. It's cleared by Holland and Pericord. It could potentially be an Aston Villa opportunity to go all the way back to the goalkeeper. A big kick up finds Pericord on this left hand side. And uh, I mean, that was an absolutely dreadful pass. And thankfully, we win the ball back. David Pierre finds Marlon Gill in the centre of the park. He's got Roger on this left hand side who goes past his man. He whips it in back post. Oh, Karaviev was there, but it drifts just past him. Back to Marvin. Can oh, that's a penalty ref. He was in the box. I'm sure he was. Please give the penalty. Oh, he's give the free kick. Never mind. It'll probably be Karaviev who steps over this and uh, see if he can get a goal. Maybe it's Fabio Andre. I'm not too sure. It is Fabio Andre standing over the... Oh, he plays a back post. It goes to Nuno, but he heads over. Another highlight now. Seven minutes to go in this first half. The ball's played over the top for Alfonso. He's in behind. It's blocked. Karaviev. Oh, if he takes that first time, he scores. He allowed the time for the keeper to get back into position and make the save. Fabio Andre with the corner door. It's played in. Garcia is there. And Jones saves it comfortably. And that is that for the first half. Complete domination by ourselves. But we can't find the way through. The Spurs game is still nil-nil. Uh, we'll have to keep an eye. Come on, boys. At least at least get the goal to put us in front. Rogers cross is poor. And it's cleared by Villa. Thankfully, it's not cleared very well. And Roger receives the ball back again. He hasn't got a lot of support. He finds Karaviev in the box. Who heads it just over. I mean, our defence is playing well. That's worth something, right? And just as I say that, Aston Villa don't score. They don't score. 25 minutes to go. Come on, boys. We need the three points if we to stand any chance of the Champions League. Villa are in behind, though. Great save by Jensen and clearance by Garcia. Uh, Aston Villa are starting to come into this more and more as the second half ticks on. We'll go down to a positive team mentality. We'll demand more from the boys. And with 20 minutes remaining, we have ourselves another highlight. The ball played to David Pierre. Uh, David Pierre is poor. 
and Aston Villa will count he's ran from his own box to our box and Jensen is within an easy save in the end. It's a corner for Villa. It is going to be taken by Florent de Silva. It's played in and we clear. Marvin to Pat on on this right hand side. It's whipped in. It's well defended by uh, Villa but eventually falls to Pat on and Roger gets his third goal of the season to put us 1-0 up with only 15 minutes remaining and we're doing our part. But Burnley are not quite doing theirs just yet. It was a bit of a strange goal, this one. Pat on's uh, header, uh, cross in. His head is clear at three attempts. And Roger just takes the ball off Pat on and scores. There is a highlight straight from kickoff. Hopefully, it's not Villa getting straight back into it. Marvin with the ball over the top. Alfonso is in behind. That's a great save by the goalkeeper. Another highlight now. David Pierre's pocket is pinched. And Pericord comes down this left-hand side for Villa. He makes it into the box and goes for goal. It's an easy slay for Klaus Jensen. Another highlight now, still 10 minutes to go. Marvin whips the ball in, it's cleared. Only as far as Karaviev tries to find uh, Alfonso, I think, instead of shooting, which was a bit strange. Probably should have took the shot on himself. But uh, we do keep possession on this right-hand side. Pierre to Marvin. He's past his man, he's in the box, don't shoot. He crosses a back post, and that's why you don't shoot wing backs. Marvin knows. You don't shoot, you cross a back post for Roger, who gets his fourth goal of the season. It's still nil-nil Spurs Burnley. I think it's going to be a fifth place finish for Crystal Palace, which after the way we started the season will be a little bit disappointing as Marlon Gill comes forward down this left-hand side, feeds it to Fabio Andre, who gets to the byline, crosses in for Marvin, and Marvin has been superb since he's joined the club. That's his third goal of the season, and uh, that goes alongside with his assist. And we go 3-0 up with only five minutes remaining in the game. Gill doing well, driving forward from central midfield. Fabio Andre getting doing well to get the byline. And Marvin's header is just a little bit too much for the Aston Villa goalkeeper. It's all the final 10 minutes has all been highlights. Um just still nothing happening in the Spurs and Burnley game. Roger switches the play to Caravia on his left hand right hand side. He's past the man. Can't get past the keeper. Spurs are down to 10 men as well, but it doesn't look like Burnley are going to take advantage. Aston Villa nil, Crystal Palace 3. We will go to the final screen just in case there was a last second goal by Burnley, but I don't think there was. And there's the final league table, boys. We don't get Champions League football. We do finish on 73 points, though, which is level with Huddersfield, which is a fantastic achievement considering the place we were around eight games or so in the league. And uh, we'll at least be proud of how we've bounced back the second half of this season. And despite not getting Champions League football, it's still a massive, massive point total for a newly promoted side. So just reflecting on this season, and I know I spoke about it numerous times over the course of the last couple of episodes, but that injury crisis really did, like, just ruin our season. It really, really did. You know, when, when it happened, uh, it was around here. We, we still won a couple of games as well, but it really started to rock us here. This was when players were returning from injury. But by that point, the morale had dropped. Everything seemed to stop going our way. And suddenly you're talking the space of four Premier League defeats in eight games is not great. Um, and it really did put our season on the bit of a, a bit of the back foot. If these games hadn't been against the biggest sides in the league and we'd played the same sides that we've played at the back end of the season, then I think we would have had a much better season. We would have been able to get grind out the wins during our poor form and our poor morale and got against the bigger sides in better form, which might have meant a few more points here and there. But here, it is what it is. Uh, you've just got to take the role with the punches in FM. You know, sometimes you're going to get a scenario where six of your first team players are injured, even your backups, and you've just got to deal with it. And we have dealt with it. You know, 73 points from a newly promoted side, as I've said, is absolutely fantastic. And we can be proud of the fact that we're getting... European football once again with another side it's just disappointing not to be up here you know I really want a season <laughs> it's probably it's probably going to be impossible but I really want a season where I'm competing at the very very top even if we're not winning it just being in the conversation in the final five games will be super exciting so as we get to the end of season stuff Crystal Palace are expecting a mid-table finish for next season of course that's going to be without me our season in review so a few will have tipped at Crystal Palace to achieve more than a top half finish heading into the season, but the Eagles confounded expectations by securing continental football for the next season. Finishing fifth, lost in the quarterfinals FA Cup, lost in the second round against MK Dons. Let's not speak too much about that. We did sell out our stadium pretty much every game with 100% full, average attendance of 26,000. So there's an avenue for Crystal Palace to potentially grow, either extending the stadium or building a new one completely. 
Our end of season awards fans player of the season was David Garcia, which I fully agree with. We'll talk about him in just a bit. David Pierre coming second, Andy Patton coming in third. Andy Patton getting goal of the season against Manchester United. I think that was a game we got beat as well. He was signing of the season at 26 million quid. And Marvin, having only come in in the January transfer period, ends up getting a young player of the season. Let's see this goal. Did we beat Man United? I can't even remember. Marlon Gill feeds it through to Andy Potton through the centre. I remember this goal now. It's, it, I mean, I mean, that's our goal of the season. <laughs> there wasn't many, many wonder goals this season, apparently. So Yuri Karaviev actually wins top goal scorer in the Premier League. And a lot of them games were playing on the right-hand side. So look how much he's improved as well. He looks absolutely phenomenal. Um, I, I'll not lie to you. I was expecting more from him. He averages 7.11 which for an attacking player is pretty low, especially one that scored as many goals as he has. But even still, looking at his attributes, I, have, I still love him. So the best players at uh, Crystal Palace, Marvin, definitely one of them. Uh, he's classed as an enthusiastic fullback now, so it seems like the media are seeing him as a right-back, which I personally see him as as well. And I think he's going to be one of the best right-backs on the game, hands down. He's stupidly well-rounded. He's got great like dribbling attribute, his technique attribute, his vision, his teamwork, his flair, his decisions. He's an attack and wing back absolute dream boat. Um, the only downside of him compared to others is sometimes the physicals are not as quite as great. He came off quite a lot in the games we did play because even though his stamina is 14, his natural fitness is only 10 and uh, that does cause him some problems when he's bombing up and down the wings. But apart from that, easily one of the best players at the club. Jim Garcia, of course, one player of the season and in my mind he's Probably, is he no, no best player, but he's getting there. He's very, very close. He was assigned in the championship, 1.9 million quid. And with the physicals like that, his mentals have developed lovely over the course of the season. He's now not top tier mentally and not by any stretch, but like good <laughs> mentally. And then you combine that with his physical his technical, technical attributes. It's absolutely fantastic. He's tackling 17, obviously being a highlight in the technical route marking and heading a 13 you know you want them improved of course you do but four star current five star potential still only 20 years old uh hopefully crystal palace don't sell him and they can start to build the defense around him yuri caravia we've sort of talked about but andy pat on although his output in terms of goals and assists wasn't stupendously high i think he's a fantastic fantastic player his first touch of 20 his technique is 17 he needs to get his passing increased, his vision of 15, he's off the ball of 15. He's just a great player and at £26 million was our most expensive signing at Palace. And I think it was well worth it. The fact that he was Scottish obviously played a bit of a fact into it. He wasn't a foreign player, I didn't have to register him as one. Um, so I just liked him. David Pierre was a man who I did not think we would be playing this season. I genuinely thought we would have signed a replacement in the summer and either sold him then or in the January or he would have been a backup player, but he ended up playing every single Premier League game. And now for an injury-stricken squad, that's pretty impressive that he's managed to keep himself fit throughout the entire time, getting an average of a 7.19 over the course of the season. So one of our weakest players in the starting eleven, I would gladly admit that, but one that performed one of the best. In terms of goal scorers, then Alexander playing on that left-hand side. He's still not natural there, which I'm a little bit surprised about. He's played there pretty much every single game he's been playing. 14 goals in 23 games is nothing to sneeze at, though, as an inside forward. Averaging a 7.11 isn't too shabby either. Martin Alfonso, um, yeah, probably a bit of a dud sign in this one. He did play better once he started going up top, but he's still only got 10 goals and 5 assists in 37 Premier League games. So he only missed one game all season. And obviously on the right hand side we sort of figured it out over the course of the season that wasn't the right place for him. And even up front he got a couple of more goals but he wasn't anything pro prolific so going back in time we'll probably look to sign somebody else. And that's pretty much it in terms of the players we really want to speak about. Marlon Gill will always be a hero just for being six foot six or whatever he was. But he was one who I was a little bit disappointed on in terms of his actual development. Uh, he did get injured a couple of times throughout the course of the season, which is why he only started 29 Premier League games. But yeah, he's pretty much the exact same player as when we signed him, which at, at his age group, he should be developing a lot quicker than that. But yeah, Crystal Palace, it's uh, it's going to be looked back on as a season of what ifs. What if the right players hadn't been injured at the right time? What if the injuries were more spread out throughout the team so our backup players could fill in? Um, and maybe we could have picked up another five or five or so points and matched Leeds United as the highest points total we've ever received. Maybe we might have, maybe we wouldn't have. It's it's all ifs, buts and maybes. But 
what is for sure is our time at Crystal Palace is over and a new journey will begin. I am going to take a look. The, so the strategy of Palace, as you will have been well aware of, was to raise as much money as humanly possible whilst we're in the Championship to set us up perfectly for the Premier League. Now, that was effective at Palace. Um, I want to take it to the next level. I want a newly relegated club. Now, unfortunately, Brentford have still got the manager, West Ham has still got the manager, and Villa have still got the manager. So it's probably not going to happen. Is there any jobs available in the pre uh, Championship? There's not. Not. <laughs> That, that's a problem. <laughs> so uh, think back to the earlier part of this series when there wasn't a job available straight away. We've had to wait till like October. If we have to wait till October, I'm not going to be able to sell a load of players. We're going to be stuck with the squad we get. And it sort of pushes back the financial aspect of things. Maybe a job might open up. Um, who's still in the playoffs? Let's have a look. So Leeds and Stoke are in the playoffs. What if... They don't get promoted, either of them. Would they sack the manager, Brendan Rodgers, at Leeds? Maybe they will. Maybe they would. Maybe one of the newly promoted League One sides, actually. Wouldn't be ideal if one of these play teams was available, but I would have to take them. Brighton have a manager. Charlton have a manager. Bolton have a manager. <laughs> Rotherham have a manager. So, <laughs> oh man, it's going to be a summer without a club. I can already feel it. But whether it is or not is irrelevant because our time at Crystal Palace is at an end. We will resign. Oh, I have so much problems with this Palace side and although we've done well, it almost feels like a little bit of a defeat. So Crystal Palace take their spot on the leaderboard. Joint third with Huddersfield is not a bad result. Only five points away from Leeds United. Could have been a much different season. Um, obviously finishing fifth technically puts them a little bit below Huddersfield, but uh, I'm giving them the joint third, I think. If you've managed to get that amount of points, you deserve your place on the leaderboard. But anyway, boys, there'll be a new club next episode. We'll wait and see if we can manage to get a job over the course of the summer or not, or whether it's going to be a season with a squad I haven't built, which will be disappointing. But anyway, lads, if you have enjoyed today's video, please consider leaving a like. And if you are enjoying my content, get yourself subscribed. But until next time, take it easy.